webinar that is focusing on ins and outs of a feedlot production system. Uh, I'm sorry that we delayed with five minutes. We are still waiting for others to join. However, before we can start with our session, uh, I'm Komucho Mashilwane, a Livestock Technical Advisor at Red Meat Institute for Transformation and Enterprise Development. And uh, before we can start, I'd like to set some class rules to say at least all of us let us try to mute our mics so we don't cause any disturbance. I was trying to, to mute some of the others uh, during the, 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 the session. And but at least let us cooperate to to try to mute all the mics at the moment, and then we let the presenter to take his part. Then after then uh, we will be taking questions at the end of the sessions, and then that's where we can further in down, um, engage on that. So as I've already introduced myself as Komuto Mashiluanya, uh, today we'll be discussing the ins of the uh, ins and out of a feedlot production. But I'm not alone. I'm joined by David Smith, who's an experienced feedlot assistant manager at Cernic, who's running day-to-day -day operation of a feedlot. So he will be giving us his expertise on all uh, the the ins and outs, on understanding on the selection of the good quality winner. At the same time, we'll be understanding the feed relation to on how we can get a good quality animal at a short period of time. And other than that, we are also joined by our experienced uh, trans head of transformation at CERNIC with Patrick Squatapatla, who has over 20 years of experience in the industry. More especially, uh, he understands the feedlot operation and also the livestock production system. So, uh, Mr. Smith, you are welcome to our webinar. Thank you very much. Welcome, guys. <clears throat> Just close that. Yeah, I think so. Okay, can everybody see the screen? I believe so. So we're going to be starting. Yes, definitely. Yes, can yes, see the yes, screen, yes, David. Yes, we can see All it. Right. Okay, so I'm quickly just going to give a, a brief um, <clears throat> introduction on myself. I am David Smith. I'm with Sarni Group almost seven years now, and um, I'm the assistant manager of the of the feedlot, and I also manage the entire background um, system of the Sarni feedlot. So I'm going to try and give you some insight on the um, the pros and the cons of a feedlot and then hopefully give some um, light on, on, on how the feedlot operates and works. Uh, a feedlot, the feedlot industry is a specialized industry. Um, I think a lot of people think a feedlot is only there just to create lots of money in a quick time. Um, if you go and look, there's nowhere in South Africa or in the world where you can go and study to become a feedlot manager. Mm -hmm. It's something you have to learn. You've got a lot of um, different facets that you have to learn about. For instance, animal health, uh, which is a veterinarian point. You have to learn animal feeding, which is a nutrition side. You have to do um, general management. You have to do financial management, all that stuff. So a feedlot, the feedlot is a specialized business um, which needs specialized um, knowledge. Um, the profit margins in a feedlot, a lot of people think feedlots make thousands of rands on, on, on cattle and um, animals that they feed. The feedlot's secret to success is in quantities. The more we feed, you make small amounts, but the more you feed, the more um, money you make on them. And then you have to be in the market. We always tell people, you can't jump the market. You can't decide, I want to feed now for December, but then January I'm stopping. And then I want to feed again for, for the next December, then you are in and out of the market. We have to stay in the market. One day we're going to make, say, 2,000 rand a head, and one day we're going to make 500 rand loss. But our average will be, say, 500 rand or whatever. So there is not big profit margins. It's quite small. And then we also have to look at the risk. As soon as you put an animal in an intensive feedlot system, you are increasing the risk dramatically. So what I mean by that is, if I have 10,000 animals in a feedlot system and I forget to add rumensin in my HPCs, I put all of those animals at risk, all 10,000 at once. There is a feedlot, I'm not going to um, name anything, but there's feedlots uh, in South Africa that had problems similar like that. Um, and then the losses is like 200, 300 cattle per day uh, or per weekend or per week. It's not it's not small money we're talking about. So the risk is increased dramatically with uh, with feedlotting of cattle. 
And then, yeah, just like I said, their feedlot, uh, a good feedlot usually has a lot of cattle, but they've also got fixed systems, infrastructure, equipment, trained and experienced teams. And then the management, they also need a, a good management system to see problems almost before they happen so that you can make preventative um, decision making in your in your day to day um, operations. I quickly listed the basic feedlot activities. So this is a very basic um, uh, introduction or uh, slide that I sh I'm showing you guys. We all start with the procurement of cattle. That's where everything starts. We've got people out there. They go and buy either from farmers directly or they go to auction houses and they buy. <clears throat> so what we are looking at, uh, I'll, I'll explain the procurement in the next slide, but we are looking for a specific type of animal for our needs. So we make a, we do the, before we buy them, we make the, we do the little sum and we say, okay, um, we have to buy for this price and this price because we anticipate the market is going to do X, Y, and Z. So then from procurement, we go to a backgrounding, um, which is in my eyes the most crucial part of the entire feedlot because there you prepare the animals for the feedlot and for the road going forward. Preconditioning is a step between backgrounding and the feedlot. It's also a crucial um, part, especially with rumen development um, that we do there before the animals go to the feedlot. And then obviously the feedlot is about 120 days project per animal that we have uh, where we put the animals in and we fatten them and then we slaughter them. Marketing is from the abattoir side um, to the market out. So they will give us feedback and say, okay, we bought these animals. The carcass was 300 uh, kilograms. Uh, we've got resistance from the market because our stakes are too big. So please, we need a carcass of 280 or 260 kilos. Please look into that. And then it comes back to us. And then we start the whole process. So it's a it's a wheel that's turning the whole time from the marketing side or the upstream side um, or the feedback they give us so that we can make better decisions when we buy animals and we feed them for slaughter. I'm quickly going to go through the procurement. The procurement is basically when we buy all the animals. So if you see there on the screens, you can look at the on the condition or the points that we are looking at. Um, and the basic is condition. We want an animal that's in a good, healthy condition. I'm not going to buy a sick animal because that problem is becoming my problem. So we don't buy sick animals. The price, obviously, I have to be correct. That's something that we, um, when we get feedback from the uh, downstream or the upstream market, then we will um, <clears throat> we will see what's going on in the market and we decide on a price. And so we will not buy above 35 rand or above. 33 rand this week, and then that's just a decision to make. Weight, we don't want to buy wieners that is 120 kilos of weight per animal, and we don't want to buy animals 280 kilos of weight. The difference is too much. There's a, a happy medium in the middle that we want to buy. Um, and then the location, we do not buy certain animals from certain areas because we are based in the northern free state, we, for instance, we do not buy from the eastern Cape in the winter because the animals are traveling at night. The um, climate changes is too much. So we lose a lot of money if we buy in the winter time from the eastern Cape. It's just an example. And then when we, we don't prefer to buy from the northern provinces because of um, Marzwater and those um, tick-borne diseases. So then again, we are going to suffer losses because those animals are not adapted for our area on this side. So there's just a few key points for you to look at. Okay, so we are gonna start with a crucial part of the feedlotting process. Uh, when, we, when we say backgrounding, backgrounding is when we buy an animal that has just been weaned from his mother. So that animal has got, doesn't know where to go, what to do, he just wants his mother. He wants to be where, where he was born. He wants to be in that area. So we buy those animals. We transport them. We take them from the mothers. We transport them. We put them in a new area. It's a lot of stress on that animal. And then a lot of animals are susceptible for sicknesses on that on that time, especially uh, pasturellas or pneumonia or, you know, your lung diseases. That's when you the animals are susceptible for that. And then also your tick-borne diseases. So what we do is, 
When the animals land at us, when they arrive on our background and farm, we vaccinate all the animals. So we vaccinate, everyone gets the same treatment. So if you say, you know, you've got uh, 100 winners, you already gave them a clostridium, in, um, clostridium vaccine. I'm going to say thank you very much, but I'm also going to give them a clostridium vaccine because they're uh, going into a high stress environment. And I have to make sure that animal has got all the cover it has. And my people are also trained on the vaccin vaccination protocol. So they will make sure the vaccines was not in the sun, was not mixed three weeks ago, and I'm using a, a useless vaccine. So that's why we vaccinate all the animals. <clears throat> we class all the animals into weight categories. So we want to, um, I always call it the bullies. We want to take the bullies away. If you put an animal of 280 kilos with one of 150, that, that calf of 150 is never going to get a chance to eat. So we just want to move away that bullying um, so we can get that calf, that 150 kilo calf or that light one. We just want to give him all the chances or the best chance that he can have. And then, of course, we start with rumen development. Uh, I'm not going to go into the rumen development because it's a it's a very um, there's a lot of things that we have to consider there. But in brief, cattle are used to graze on grass. Now, I want to put a lot of uh, energy or maize in that ration. So we have to adapt the rumen over time so that it can handle the amount of energy or maize that we want to give that animal. So it's very important to start rumen development as soon as possible and make sure the day that animal arrives in, in the feedlot that that rumen is at the top of its health. And then, of course, you can see we use a, a specially formulated backgrounding ration with a high protein. We do not want to fatten the calves on backgrounding. We just want them to build frame. So when we build frame, we want them to grow large. When they come to the feedlot, there's a lot of, lot of space for them to put meat on. So we want a tall, lean calf coming into the feedlot, and in the feedlot, they can just, they can just fatten up. And then the animals on the backgrounding, um, it differs. The animals stay on backgrounding for at least 20 to 80 days. And then we want them to move to to the preconditioning, the next stage, when they are three, 230 kilos and above. So we will maybe buy animals from uh, 180 kilos, and then we will keep them there until they are 230 kilos. Um, that is the best performance for us in the feedlot. Okay, preconditioning is a very, very short um, time that the animals are there. So basically, what happens? We do the final, uh, we do the final adaption of the rumen on preconditioning. So the animals are still in big camps, um, still quite low stress environment. But then we go from a, a high protein ration to a energy based ration, and we will increase the intake um, to almost at lip, but not yet fully at lip. But almost at lip, so when the animals get to the feedlot, we can go on an at lip basis, and then the animals are fully adapted and they can just grow. So the main aim for the feedlot weight that we want to go into the feedlot is 240 40 kilos and above, not nothing, nothing below that. Okay, so by now the feedlot receives healthy animals who's already adapted on a full feed. They're already classed into perfect weight categories. The sex is also split um, on backgrounding, so we, we never mix bulls and heifers. So when they go into the feedlot, all of those animals are used to each other. And the hierarchy is already been sorted out. So you will always get animals that are more dominant and less dominant animals, but they also sort each other out. The less dominant one knows, I can go and eat after nine o'clock, Every day after nine o'clock, he can go and he can go and eat, and the dominant one will eat first. So that hierarchy has already been sorted out with the animals. Intake is being in, increased to an ad libs uh, ad lib basis, and then we've got a very very sound bunk management system uh, in a feedlot. That's very crucial. If you have uh, if you underfeed those animals for two or three days consecutively, you can start getting a red gut or even bloat um, and acidosis with your cattle. So the idea will be to have a very good bunk management system and you can ensure that your animals are being fed correctly. And then obviously we start on a specific energy ration and then we go, we call it hotter. So we want to have more energy 
and then a little bit lesser protein. So as the animal um, goes through the stage in feedlot, then we can, um, I was going to say, we can give them a, a stronger energy ration, <clears throat> which will give us more growth. Okay, so that's basically the end of the feedlot period. Then the animals are all, um, we call them dispatch. We take the animals out of the pens and then we send them to the abattoir where they will be slaughtered and then we get feedback from them. So they will give us basic feedback feedback around our carcass mass, the, uh, the grade of the animals, where if there's too many A1s, for instance, where it means if the animals are too lean, then we can make a management change and say, okay, these animals are too short with us. We have to keep them longer in the feedlot. We have to go hotter on the rations or whatever, so that the marketing and the end market, the users, they can get a more a, a piece of meat that they want with enough fat, but not too much fat, big enough, but not too small, not too big. Uh, so we can give them the perfect, perfect um, piece of meat that they that they want. <clears throat> Okay, then just a quick um, conclusion. I think it's it's quite an important conclusion. Um, feedlots are specialized businesses with people with uh, management skills from a lot of time, so we can do the optimal in the feedlot. What I saw with my experience, there's a lot of people that think uh, feeding animals is quite easy and you can make a lot of money quickly. If it was so easy, why is not everybody doing it and succeeding in the long run? Feedlotting is not such an easy project. You have to be dedicated fully and you've got, you need systems in place. From a farmer's point of view, and that's the, I'm talking out of my experience, I would rather that rather optimize my breeding stock and program to get the maximum out of my cow calf combo and produce heavier weaners and healthier weaners. Why I say this is I saw a lot of people on the, on the auctions. A lot of people, they sell their weaners for 150 kilos or 160 kilos. The condition is not so hot, all that stuff. If you go from 150 kilos to 220 kilos, that's a 70 kilo gap um, or difference that you that you have there. So the feedlot is going to make money on that 70 rand gap or that 70 kilo gap. That's almost two and a half thousand rand that the farmer is just losing there because they are selling the weaners too light. So I would rather go and say, okay, let's have a, a good and healthy um, breeding stock program to say, okay, how can I get my weaners healthy and heavier? And then build relationships with your feedlots. Um, if you if I know I can buy can buy from one person every year at the same time, I can buy 50 weaners, but they are all going to be healthy. They're going to be in a good condition. They perform good in the feedlot. For me as the feedlot, it's the best thing that we can do. I will keep on buying from that person. But if I buy this year from somebody and they dies 10 animals in the first month and the animal does not grow, they've got measles, all that stuff, then I'm going to say, whoa, 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 this person, uh-uh, I'm not going to buy anymore. And that, per that, that farmer is going to struggle selling weaners because the people are going to say, no, 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 we are not going to buy this type of, of um, I don't want to say sick weaner, but um, I, I need an optimal wiener for the feedlot. And if I can't get that optimal wiener, I'm not going to buy it because then I'm going to lose money and the farmer is going to lose money. So that's basically the, the conclusion of my, of my um, slide. Um, you must please tell me if there is any questions or um, if something was unclear or so. Right, Komoto, you're welcome. Your guests are welcome to ask questions. We'll be able to be ready to answer the questions. All right. Okay. Oh, uh, thank you so much, uh, David, for a nice presentation. Uh, I think because now I can see that there are three questions that are being asked by farmers. The first one, I think I saw breed from your slide, but didn't tap into it. So I think uh, maybe the farmer here is trying to say, does the type of a breed matter in relation to feedlot performance? And then the second question says, why would the feedlot penalize the farmer for hump of boran cattle? So does the hump of an animal matter? And also why uh, some of the animals are being uh, penalized based on that? So I think uh, those are the most important questions that we can address for now. Okay, I'm quickly gonna start with the breed. Um, so the feedlot, you must understand, we, we, we need to make money out of a cat, out of an animal, eh? 
So there's a reason why we do not buy Jersey calves and feed them because they do not perform as well. So there is specific cattle out there who does not perform well. If we get them for the right price, and that price is going to be less than your Bonsmara, Beefmaster, Simmentaler animals, uh, then we can buy them. It's fine. But let's take, uh, I don't want to pick on a specific breed, but there's a few breeds, um, Afrikaner, Buran, Nguni, um, Tulis. A lot of those breeds do not perform well in the feedlot. If I give an animal five kilos of feed to eat, and it can give me, and it can give me 1.8 kilos of growth, versus I give him five kilos of feed and he only gives me one kilo of meat, which one is more profitable? Mm. So that's the. I think that's the. That's the. It's a. It's a question on a question. If if, if you if you understand me, just think how we look at it. A lot of those animals do not perform so well in a feedlot. So that's why we prefer not to buy them. We will rather prefer uh, rather pre uh, prefer to buy your more um, uh, well-known meat breeds um, than yeah, your lesser, your more hardened cattle. Okay. And then obviously we do not buy, we do not always buy um, um, your milk types because they also do not perform so well in the field. You can get, you can feed Holsteins, but like I said, um, the the price has to be right, and that's not always going to be what the farmer wants. And the other thing is, we 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 buy quality. We don't compromise in terms of mm. quality, and more so, we don't want animal that are behaving like wild animal in the feed lot because mm. the cost would be too high in terms of fixing the crawls. And, and, and it will also be able to injure the employees in the feedlot. And taking it to the abattoir as well, it will jump like a, a human being, like you, Komozo. We want the animal that is uh, very tame, like as David said, your Bonsmara, your Simbra, your Angus, your Dragon's Burger, your uh, and all those types of things. But we're not at all, you know, buying your, your Nguni, your, your Boran. There is a lot of argument about it. And we choose not to buy your Nguni, your Boran, your dairy breed. The reason being, it does not work for us. Something that it does not work for us, we don't buy it. And also, we always encourage people to buy, and especially women in farming. When they enter farming, they need to buy the animal that are tame, like Bonsmara. Don't buy something that is wild, that is not going to give you money. And then people will be African. Remember, you are farming for us. Whatever that you produce is us who is buying. The feedlot industry is buying between 75 to 80 percent of your produce. So if you're going to be selling to the wedding, to to the uh, to the uh, funeral, you're not going to make money. You make money because you we buying your produce. Uh, thank you so much for it was a mouthful uh, answer because I think most of the farmers they think that uh, we as a red meat industry we discriminate against other breeds, but it's a fact that we need to look at the economics in relation to whether you're going to make a profit or not. But I think from the answers that you have gave, they're going to uh, understand the the reason behind. And then again, I can see your hand on the day of May Poloko. You can uh, unmute yourself. Uh, thanks, thanks, Commons, and thanks to David and Patrick. Yeah, thanks well for a wonderful presentation, concise presentation. Mine is directly number one what are the opportunities uh, for one to go? I'm operating the backgrounding space, maybe just a bit of background. In the past year, I've just been doing trials. I like doing these things systematically and learning the space as to what it takes. And thanks. I think uh, the points that David mentioned validated that to a large extent I've been trying to do the right thing. But the question here directly is, what are the opportunities for somebody who's in the background and they believe that they can produce what will conform with what's ready to go into preconditioning? That's the first question. Um, as an example, uh, I've had cases where when I play around with the feed in some instances, I would get up to two kilogram uh, per average daily gain of two kilograms. And my goal would be if I have a direct deal, I only supply to my suppliers cattle that I'm sure identified as having minimum of one and a half kilograms a day. 
paramount opportunities there. The second question is, uh, I do uh, my small breeding stock is Ponsmara and, and Brown Swiss. And the goal was to also mix the two because of the larger frame of the Brown Swiss. Uh, the Brown Swiss being a dual uh, a post kettle, how does it do compared to pure uh, milk breed? Am I uh, take is it a good idea that I cross the two, but also on its own, how do you treat it? Because I, I presume you wouldn't quite treat it the same, you would treat the Friesland, the pure milk breed. My cattle are quite huge. The pregnant ones are over 700 kilos. And I think that there is a lot of meat in there, you know, the cows. So yeah, in closing, can I sell my cattle at over 250, ready for precondition and feed your team and the, the breeds? Thank you, comments on the team. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, can I, I'm going to respond to that. Okay, so yes. one thing you must understand um, from our point of view, the reason why we will put all our animals in our backgrounding system, and, and I, I can't talk for other feedlots, but I understand the trend is mostly the same. Um, we buy a lot of animals from different places, so we do not always now know how was the backgrounding done. Was it done according to our standards? If it was not done to our standards, that animal is going to come in preconditioning and in the feedlot, and maybe it's going to have a burnt rumen. So I will, I'm going to go, so all animals that Saranik buys, we put throughout the back, through the backgrounding system. We will revaccinate them again. We will put them in the backgrounding system and we will take them through um, <clears throat> because then we know we treated the animals as we wanted to treat them, as we see fit to treat them. And that's been working very well for us for the last few years. The one thing about the animal, about you say Bonsmara and the um, brown Swiss, um, if you are willing to drop your prices on your on your when you sell, then you can do that because if you are going to cross a dairy with a with a Bonsmara, you are not going to receive the price that we're going to pay for purebred um, for purebred uh, Bonsmara calf. So for for instance, for a purebred Bonsmara, you will get say 32 rand, and then for a Swiss with, with for a cross. Um, you are, let's say, going to get only uh, 29 rand. That's three rand per calf. Over a 200 kilo calf, 600 rand you lose just there. So just keep in mind, um, if you've got purebred meat cattle, prefer to stay with them. Just optimize them. You can do a type of backgrounding, but just don't go all the way to a 250 or 280 kilo calf because the feedlots don't want that heavy. So they're also going to penalize you. And... Um, yeah, we, we have to put that calf through everything again. So we're going to lose. So that's why you're going to be penalized on that. Okay, that was very much for. Okay, I think uh, you were answered that day, a poloco, kiochopela, or we sell it so fast. All right, no, thank you. And then I can see on the chat board there is another question that says, why feed loss do not have or provide the shelter on the feeding trough? Uh, isn't it that uh, that is going to affect the, the feed quality? And then, okay, and why is that since we normally don't see uh, happening? And then the second question is that uh, what is a good number of calves for a startup farmer in the feedlot and what kind of, of calves to grow for feedlot? All right, let's take only those two questions for now. <clears throat> second question. The okay, second question is that uh, the number of animals that a farmer needs to start up a feedlot and also what kinds of, of calves do one needs to to start with, but I think on the issue of calves, you have already addressed it on the type of a breed and and also the weight side. Yeah. Answer the shelter. Mm -hmm. Okay, but so regarding the, the shelter, uh, so the the main thing we do not why feedlots mostly do not provide shelter. Number one, it's a high cost input, and number two, the sun is a natural um, cleaning agent. So you want your crops to be open to the sun. To be on your crops. If you cover it with shade, um, if there is water or something around your your feeding troughs, it's only a breeding place for bacteria. So you want the sun to be directly on your feeding troughs to disinfect your feeding troughs. So that's the one about the about the um, shading. And then again, the breeds. <clears throat> it's difficult to it's difficult for me to say how many calves you need. The only advice that I will say is. You will have to go and make sure how many you need to fit your budget. You need a budget and say, okay, I need X amount of money per month, and then you will have to work out how many cattle you need for that. Um, 
I would just say, please stick to a specific breed. There's reasons we've got specific breeds. Like, let's take Bonsmara. Or if we don't want to take Bonsmara, we can take a, a Simmentaler. It's specifically bred for that reason. If you give me a Simmentaler purebred, <clears throat> I know how to handle that cattle. But if you crossbreed um, as you want, then we are not always going to give you the full price for that crossbred cattle. I'm rather going to penalize you a little bit because we do not know what's happening there. Maybe that animal looks very nicely, but when it gets to the feedlot, it only gives, gives me an ADG of 1.5 or 1.3. Once again, I'm losing money. I would rather buy purebred um, cattle. So you can choose whatever breed you need uh, or, you've, or you've, you know, who's in your area, but then just keep it purebred uh, or as pure as possible. And then you will have to budget for yourself to see how many you need to survive. I think it's very important to all of us to note that most of our people one will have will, will take pension and get 1.5 million rand and decide tomorrow and say I want to build a fit lot without any knowledge. And David already highlighted to the fact that when you start the fit lot, you need to have a lot of knowledge. You need to go out and go learn practically, not theory. Even if you have got degrees or masters. Uh, theory cannot help you in the field industry. You need to be hands-on to be able to learn practically because now you're going to tell us about what you have learned in the book, but you don't have practical. It does not It does not work. Many people in South Africa who has attempted to open the feedlot failed because they didn't have experience. Remember, always when someone talks to you about the feedlot, feedlot is a numbers game. Mm. And then fit, in fit lot industry, we don't compromise in terms of quality. Mm. When we say to you, we want winners, we want you to send us the video so that we can see the type of animal that you have. If it is not really good for us, we can always see it on the video that this is not this is the, this winners are going to lose a lot of money. So, guys, fit lot is a numbers game, and fit, in fit lot industry, we don't compromise in terms of quality. Mm. We don't buy winners of Nguni. You can sell them wherever that you want to sell. We don't buy winners or that are crossbreed that we don't know of whether maybe the performance it will be able to perform in the feedlot industry, in our feedlot or not. We want the animal that can clearly or purely perform in our feedlot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then in addition to that, Komoto, yes. may I always encourage people you know, feedlot as a standalone business, mm. you may not be able to make it because remember, we have got an abattoir. Ours is a value chain mm. from the farm to the fork. We produce winners in our own farm, though we don't have enough, but we also buy it outside. And whatever that we produce from our feedlot, we sell it to the, we send it to our own abattoir. Each entity is entity of its own. The feedlot is standing on itself. We sell to the abattoir. The abattoir buys from us and they buy in quality. The abattoir, if it is not quality, they question in the feedlot as to you are supplying now, you're supplying us now with rubbish. We don't want that. Then rather buy the quality winners. That's the reason why we say we don't compromise in terms of quality. If you've got feedlot as a standalone business, then it means you 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 all going to sell your animal to our abattoir at our own price. We will buy them at our own price, not at your price that you want. Whether you're running at a loss, we pay the price determined by uh, yourself, Komoso, beef, uh, meat, uh, meat industry, right? Mm. Yes. So, and Dr. Patrick, so what you're saying is that if a farmer wants to be successful in the feedlot industry, they need to have the whole value chain. What about the farmers having maybe... Uh, Not the whole yep. value chain. You can okay. always have a small feedlot of, let's say, let's say 500 animals. Mm. Because feedlot is a numbers game. Okay. And then have a place where you can slaughter and collect all your carcasses to your own meat value, to your own uh, meat wholesaler or mm. retail store. And then from the retail store, you can sell it on a reasonable price uh, and, and, and supply your butchery, supply your wedding people, your function people, and all those types of things. Rather than to say, to have a dream, a dream last night and say, I want to go to open a feed lot. You don't even know, you don't even have a single knowledge about mm -hmm. running a feed lot, but you want to run a feed lot. Feed lot alone is a standalone business. Many people failed 
because they didn't know the cost. Do you know how much is the cost of a winner to raise the winner from day one to day last? And mm. how much is the profit? Those are the questions that you need to ask yourself before you dream to open your own feet lot. So what are the most uh, important, uh, I could say, capital or the most expenses in the feed lot that one farmer farm should take into consideration? Um, <clears throat> so if you if you want to, if you want to consider, first of all, you will have to get some insight on the feed lot. How does it work? Uh, what's the day to day running of the feed lot so that people can see how it's going to work? And then obviously it's going to take money. Mm. Um, I think that's the main thing. A feed lot. If I give you an, a rough idea, the amount of animals that we have in our feedlot is 200 million, roughly. That's that. That's the cost that the animals that we have here. That's the worth of them. So, um, it's going to take money. The the equipment that we have, one tractor is 1.3 million. Mm. Uh, okay, obviously we're on a larger scale. If we're on a smaller mm. scale, by all means, it's not going to be that much. But um, if you are working on a small scale and you do the feedlot, then you need knowledge you need experience um, if you can work let's say for a year at a feedlot or something you can gain some knowledge and then you can go and say okay now i've got now i've got some i've got some knowledge and then you can start on small scale and say okay let's have i've got 20 20 animals but you can't be dependent on that money yet because maybe you're going to have slip ups uh maybe you're not going to do well maybe your feeding is not going to be up to standard or whatever so you need to say let's have um 20, 20 animals and then we start a feedlot. Then you have to do it and you have to stay in the market. You have to, you sell that 20, maybe you're going to buy 21. You sell that 21, you buy 22. Until you gain your own knowledge and you see, but this works for me in my area with the butcheries, oh, there's the abattoirs, um, the calves that I can buy, all that stuff. You have to start small and go, but don't start and say, I'm going to get 100 cattle tomorrow and I'm going to build you know, a very nice place, and then tomorrow um, you cry because you, yeah, you lost a lot of money. And then in addition to that, uh, Komuto, um, as I'm saying to you, people must never think like to have master's or PhD or degree, you can run a fit lot. That is, mm. you cannot run a successful fit lot. Mm. You're going to run a failed fit lot, then your fit lot is going to fail. Remember, you need to learn practically about the processing medicine that we're using in the feedlot. Mm -hmm. Learn about it. And then when we talk about, let's say maybe we talk about clostridials mm -hmm. medicine that we're yes. using in the feedlot, mm -hmm. then you must not just know one medicine and say, ah, I know Coclavex, I know Covixin 10, mm -hmm. I know Pondibat 10, mm -hmm. I know One Shot Ultra 7. These all are for clostridials then you need to know and have an option. Then if, let's say, you, we're talking about viruses medicine, you mustn't tell us about, I know Bovisheet Gold, I know Bovitec 3. We want you to know all these combination of medicine that if you don't have this, you, you have got this. Remember, in the feed lot, we've got challenges of the animal that are getting sick, are getting mm -hmm. bloated on daily basis, getting sick, and then in, uh, having respiratory diseases infection. So those animals need to be treated. You need to be at the feedlot and, and, and be able to learn practically how do you treat those, medi those animals. <laughs> to the extent of saying to you, if you know the medicines, like let's, say, let's talk about rest flow, your new flow, mm. and all those types of medicines, you need to know what is the contents of those medicines, which group are they belongs to. Those are the most important thing because now you're going to use rest flow, new flow, uh, new flow. You don't even know the context of the contents or composition of it. You're going to use one thing repeatedly uh, again and again and again. The same like many farmers they use in teramycin. One will use teramycin today. Tomorrow he's using high tent 120. Tomorrow is using Reverend, Reverend LA or Reverend uh, Reverend 100 and somycin and all this. He's using the same thing and the same thing again and again treating the animal, you need to get, one need to get exposure. So farmers, it means it's very important for you to understand the active ingredient of the medication rather than just focusing on the trade name. Because that's a message for for that in order for you to succeed uh, to succeed in a fit lot. So, uh, Dr. Patrick and Dr. David, I've also seen another question. They say, uh, is it 
is it true or it's a meat for a farmer who doesn't have a fruit farmer who doesn't have a maize a side that is planted can it uh, okay i think what the farmer is trying to say here is that uh if if i don't have maize that i'm producing by myself i'm not going to be successful in the fruit lot is it true or it's an, or, or it's not true there's a lot of there's a lot of factors. You can't factor only one thing. So in a feedlot, you've got a lot of things. You've got the maize price, you've got your wiener price, you've got your slaughter price, you've got gain and conversion rates and all that stuff. So you can't say only if you if I don't have maize, I can't do it. If you if you if you have to buy maize, by all means you buy it, but it has to be the right price. Mm. That's why I said in the beginning and on on the previous question of Patrick on the medicines, a feedlot manager or pe person running a feedlot has got as need need to have uh, knowledge of veterinarians mm. needs nutrition value um, knowledge needs financial management so that you can understand if my maize price is this and have to buy all of these these things the transport and all that stuff is going to be this okay so my feeding price is this is it worthwhile or not then you can make a decision say okay I have to buy everything that I want to put in so it's going to be you know everybody makes some profits or you know markups um, if you've got your own maize, by all means, then you say, okay, I've got my own maize. I'm going to put it in the feedlot on cost price. Then I'm going to make a lot of money in the feedlot. If you have to buy it, your margin is going to be smaller, but that's a, a you will have to do that um, uh, calculation for, for that. Yeah, in addition to that, Kumutso, um, I think farmers must be aware that um, if you want to open a feedlot and be successful with, with it, you need to first look at your location. If you have got a sort of like feed meal, uh, is it um, a milling company, milling company, whereby you will be able to buy chop at a reasonable price. The chop price, the going price of the chop price is between 2,600 and 2,800 now. And then what is the price of maize at the moment? It's about 4,200 price of maize, isn't it? So isn't it that better if maybe you can just buy chop at your local milling um, um, uh, milling milling company and then mix your feet and be able to feed your animal? So my honest advice would be, as a farmer, if you want to open a feed lot, you must identify places where you can buy your chop at a reasonable price. And also, if you can, you need to have sort of like cultivated pastures. Harvest grass, do bale so that you can cut the cost of the feedlot. Remember, feedlot profit is not very high. Um, they are the, the highest that you can get at times, you can get at least 500 rand per animal, or sometimes even you can even uh, do break even, especially if you are a price taker. Then price taker is someone who is running a feedlot uh, as a standalone business. Then we are the price makers because we can sell our meat to our own value chain, to our own butcheries, rather than to sell to uh, your big store like your pick and pay shop, right, and all that. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Seems like also the questions on the chat box they're also hitting. Uh, some of the okay, one of the question also says, uh, what is the best method to manage feedlot waste as it contains a lot of harmful substance it's, uh, to the environment, especially for emerging farmers? So how do you deal with waste in your feedlot production? Uh, well, I guess that will be manure production. Yeah. That's yes. what I mean. Yes. Okay, so your manure production, if you've got crops, you can use it, but obviously you will have to go and learn more about manure. Um, you can't just go and throw four tons of manure on your maize fields and hope it's going to be a good profit that side. So you will have to um, gain some knowledge regarding your manure production. Do you maybe have to do some, um, do you have to compost it first or, or whatever? So <clears throat> there's always, you can use the manure, it's, it's a good product to use, but you will have to go and and, and um, learn about the manure, what it's going to, what, what you can do about it, what you can do with it. Okay. Hey. 
No, all right. Now I think uh, that is well answered. And then they say, what is an optimal weight for a winner that the farmer has to produce? Meaning has to produce, I think maybe has to produce for an auction for or maybe a direct uh, sale to a feedlot. So what is a recommended weight that, but I think you have covered that, but just to answer for that, what would you say? Okay, so I will say, I think a win-win for the farmer and the feedlot will be about say 200 to 220 kilos. Okay. Um, if you go too high, you're going to be penalized. If you go too low, the farmer is going to lose. So 200 to 220 will be my the optimal that I say. But remember, the, the winner needs to be aged between seven to eight months. Eh? Yeah. Mm. It mustn't be 12 months old, still weighing 220. That one, we don't want it. We don't really want to feed goats, uh, uh, winners that are like goats or sheep. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> And then also, what are the common problems that you experience during the, the, the backgrounding system? Okay, so your mobility, right? Your mobility is your sick animals. That rate is quite high. And then mostly will be pneumonia-based um, illnesses. So animals will, have, will tend to have more pneumonia-based problems. So you will have to have a sharp eye on that. And then your treatment has to be fast and quick to help those animals. Right. That's the that's the main thing that I will say on the background is pneumonia. All right, no, I think it makes sense. Uh, farmers, um, done with the chat box. Any hand? Is there anyone who like to answer, uh, ask uh, any question at the moment? Everything is clear, I guess. Okay, now in absence of questions, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, dear uh, David, and also uh, Patrick for being part of our webinar where farmers, they've learned a lot about the feedback production that uh, this is not just a production system. You need to understand that how does it operate, what are the economic factors, and also what are the production factors for them to choose uh, the right breeds or the right animals that are going to perform in the, in the feedback production, what are the requirements, and also what what are the things that are going to make them to be sustainable in the long term? So thank you so much for being part of our webinar. And I'd like to give you this opportunity to say any take home message to our farmers. No, I think the people must just uh, uh, sit around that table, make your, make your, um, just think about your farming. If you've got an ex extensive um, cattle farming, optimize that. Don't grab, don't hope to grab to something else that you don't have enough knowledge of or is higher risk. Um, I would rather say go and optimize your farming um, setup so that you can make maximum money on that and grow on that. Um, and then if you want to expand to like a feedlot or something else, it's going to take time. It's going to take lots of time. Uh, and it's going to always remember it's a higher risk. But yeah, there's always there's always hope. You will just have to make the calculations very, very finely. Very nice. Right. The farmers in general, Kumutsu, they need to understand that feedlots, um, if you want to make money, you mustn't run it as a standalone <laughs> business. Rather opt to have sort of like a butchery or meat wholesaler so that when you have got one animal that you're going to slaughter, as an example, it cannot give you less than 20,000 rand uh, pe uh, when you cut it into pieces. It will give you more than that. And then in that way, you will be making a good profit. Rather than to, to run a feedlot as a standalone business and sell the meat or carcasses to our bush, our abattoir, we're going to pay you according to the meat price for that day. So you may not be able to get what you want. And then your profit there is going to be less than 200 rand or less than 100 rand. And whereas you're spending 150 days uh, looking after this animal, at the end of the day, you're making 100 rand per head. Mm -hmm. Or you may even make a, a, a break even or a loss. So farmers must be aware. They must never attempt to start a feedlot without a proper knowledge or without, without having a proper person in the form of mentor to look after you or guide you or help you or hold your hand. And thank you very much for the great opportunity, Komoto. Um, thanks, farmers. I hope you you welcome still to ask us questions. My email is patrick at cernigroup.co.za and David Smith, your email? Uh, David S, but it's David with a W. 
David S at Sarnik. That's your Zera. Great. Okay. No, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, if you have any questions, you can just email directly to them, or you can also send us an email. My email is komoto at rmitech.co.za. Uh, till we see you next time, looking forward to engage you in our upcoming webinar. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this presentation. And uh, if maybe you want to recap or maybe uh, you want to make some follow ups, this link, uh, this this webinar was recorded and it's going to be shared on our online platform, which is the Red Meat Kuluma on YouTube. So you can just make some uh, a, a, a recap on it. So uh, thank you so much. And I'd like to say good luck with your production system and thank you for attending.